this is, a interest, this is an interesting place to start. What it means is basically you've got picture, picture, and that, the, that what the artist is doing is figuring out what's in the picture and why the sequence is the way it is, and that's what constitutes the storytelling. I would add one word to this definition, which I'll go through in a second. So according to McLeod's definition, is this comics. Yeah. And why, 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 why? Oh, okay, they're juxtaposed pictures. Yes. And they are in a sequence. That's correct. It meets the definition. But is it comics? Does that look like comics to you? What's missing? Story. Words. Well, you can have words for sure, but you can also have silent comics. Right. Sure. Uh, so. These are pictures. It's not an artist's rendition. That's correct. So that's an important element. <laughs> Here's another one. Well, they do. There are some people do do comics using photographs, but they're generally referred to as comedy. It's got its own yeah, it's a like it's sub-label. A, it's a separate medium. I would argue that, that the, the presence of the artist's hand is really important. So this is a this is a comic from the early 1990s that is a computer-generated, not like a, an artist using computers to make comics. This is a computer making comics out of random images and words. Is this a comic? No. Indeed, <laughs> the very title of it gives it away. That's why. Um, so, what's missing in both of these is, from from McLeod's definition, is if you say juxtaposed pictorial or other images in deliberate sequence, I would just add this word drawn, drawn images, because the artist's hand really not only adds to the storytelling experience. I mean, if you go to that Kirby Cafe and like every image there is throbbing with the energy of Kirby's artistic <coughs> hand on the brush, and in any other hand, those same images would not pack the same narrative payload or visual impact. So there's something about comics being drawn that's really important to them, in addition to them being in sequence. That, I like that, narrative payload. <laughs> but then I want to remember what that is. So, you know, when McLeod was writing in 93, it was the dawn of the digital age, and of course McLeod is very far ahead on, on digital stuff, so at the time that he was writing, you know, like we had printed comics were the default. And printed comics have certain attributes to them that are, you know, important. Like for example, they're a finite length and they're the pages themselves are finite. So you can have a big comic, like a big artist edition or, or uh, you know, like a um, Windsor McKay Sunday page that's, you know, a bed sheet, or you can have a digest size, but whatever the size of the page is, that's the page. And the book is the number of pages that are printed, no more, no less. And what you're buying is that. Um, with digital comics, you have what McLeod and others call the infinite canvas, which is that you're, you can keep adding pages after the story is finished. You can take the story up in different directions, depending on which way that you're going with it. You can navigate through those pages in different ways. So if you want to limit yourself to a page size and a page length and a discrete story, what used to be mandatory because that's how the medium worked right. is now a creative choice because you can choose to work in an infinite canvas. And so if you don't, why not? Um, there's a physical quality to the to the digital comics with the, the experience, the paper, the ink, the surface quality, the smell of the pages, which a lot of people like. There's a there's something to the medium, the physicality of it, that adds to the experience in all kinds of ways thing it's more interactive. It's interactive, it's more intimate, it's like it's physical. It's like you, you experience it with, with multiple senses. Mm. Um, and that even reproducing comics that used to be printed on newsprint on better paper, for example, changes the experience a little bit. Um, ask, ask my colleague uh, Arlen Schumer about that. He has a, a, that is one of the many strong opinions he holds. It also changes the way that the artwork and the coloring in particular uh, has been color reproduced, like different the exact same page could print very, very differently on different types of paper. Newsprint super absorbent, yep. but the papers that a lot of people use now in printed comics are not as absorbent, so the color reproduces really differently. And yeah. the net looks completely differently on a screen. Yeah. I mean, Neil Adams used to like bash the production people at DC because they, the production people said, we can only do 16 pages. He says, don't be ridiculous, you can do 64, uh, sorry, 16 colors. He says, don't be ridiculous, you can do 64 colors on the same equipment if you use it right. And so
So, you know, it's like uh, the, the sort of technical innovation, and then now we can do millions of colors because of Photoshop and things like that, and so the, that changes the experience of comics. It also changes the, I mean, just yeah. to sidebar really quick, it also changes the, the approach to your design. Like, for instance, the reason that all the uh, classic superheroes are on these primary colors is because of the technical limitations involved in printing back in the 1930s and 40s. Uh, yeah, it changes, it changes the content. Whereas if you're in digital comics, if it's displayed on, you know, if it's displayed on a device, then the device is mediating the experience in a different way than the, than the paper is. Um, with printed comics, obviously with paper, it's printed, it's static, it doesn't move. Even if you want it to move, it's, the movement is in your imagination. In a digital environment, you can add motion. In fact, they fire, uh, what they create, they call them motion books because of, uh, to differentiate, because there's a range of motion that takes place. So whether, if you're operating in that medium and motion is available, choosing not to use motion is also a choice. Um, in the same way comics are silent, you read them in your head, um, in, in a digital environment you can add audio. Um, there's a uh, scarcity, so that room is, the exhibit room is full of collectible comics. Why? Because there's a limited print run, and if you didn't get one, then you got to buy one from someone who's got it. Digital, there is no scarcity. You can keep making additional copies at zero cost. There's an unlimited supply. So that changes the atmospherics, so you're not buying stuff just to collect it. You know, I mean, I, I was talking to a guy from Comixology who was saying, you know, like, we're doing variant covers. Like, why? Who cares? Like, they're not collectible. They're like, I mean, you know, it's like it's good, it's good work for the cover artist, but it's, uh, you know. So, um, and then, and then um, physical media deteriorates with age. So this is another property of comics in the physical world, whereas digital media gets better. So if you started out reading digital comics in 2009, you were reading them formatted for a, say, a 1040 display or something like that. Then, uh, I think in 2013, uh, Comixology went back and they re-scanned all of their stuff in higher resolution. So if you had those books in your collection, the next time you opened up that same comic that you had read, the resolution on it was better. Now they're going to 4K, and a lot of other people are going to. So every time you open that digital comic, the look of it potentially gets better, which is kind of a, the opposite of what we'd expect from digital comics. From so all of these things have are changing the experience. You might say, well, it's not fundamental, but all of this little stuff adds up to the way that we view this. I think there's. A, I, would, I would maybe add um, there's a big difference in access to these uh, different different forms of comic books because to get printed comic books, I mean, very few people subscribe to printed comic books anymore. That used to be the main model with Marvel and DC in the old days. Now most people get their printed comics from a comic shop. Not every community has a comic shop. You know, they, so you might have to go to a Comic Con to find the printed comics, or you might have to like figure out, you know, what you like by reading it online and then buy it on, you know, on Amazon or at your local bookstore if you can find comics there. Whereas digital com, are you including web comics in digital comics? Yeah. Is that all one? Okay. So digital and web comics are potentially much more widely accessible, but there's an economic barrier for some people because you have to have access to a device and a service to be able to download them, right? So they're so if they're reaching in some ways very different audiences. I've seen. I think there's a, like in my mind it's a Venn diagram that printed comics have you know one audience. Digital comics have another audience that overlaps with that a little bit, and then web comics kind of have their own almost completely separate audience. So there's a tiny bit of overlap in the middle, but it's a much more diverse audience than it used to be in the ac the different forms of access. I think are part of that. I do just want to say so uh, digital comics are not necessarily indefinite. We have this idea that data can always live forever. Right. Um, one thing we're starting to realize is most of the ways we have to store data right now fail. Hard drives fail. Digital, like, that's a lot of backup. Mm -hmm. That's a good, that's another good point. You sort of touched on that, is that if you use an earlier technology, 
technology and technology moves on, it's going to be to the point where it's so obsolete, you can no longer access it. Yes, I really miss my CD-ROM comics from the 90s. I just want to break those out and play them sometimes. Yeah, they don't work anymore. Um, yeah, and, and 78 records is true. It's that that's one of the features. And there's a whole bunch of stuff on the business side about like the 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 fact that you don't need gatekeepers to do digital comics. I know Ratefire has really good relationships with like Media Dart, and so um, people anywhere they have opened up their platform so that people can come and publish a motion book. You don't need an editor to say no. Um, there's a web comic that I know of that's from Brazil. It's produced by like street kids in Rio talking about their experiences, and it's done in this like really beautiful kind of folk art style. These are voices that we would not hear in this country, and they're just a click away. So it's 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 opened up a lot of new opportunities for content. Although, as a former editor, I just want to say editors can be a force for good. As well. <laughs> they can help you make your work better. So so much. <laughs> there you go. So what's next for storytelling? So I'll be, you know, like looking at all of these things with, with interactive content, um, you know, and, and all of these choices that now face you. Like what, what are some of the, the cool things that are out there? And, and some of you may have seen some of these. Uh, I just want to run through a couple of examples of really cool experiments in storytelling in comics that have taken place. Um, this is one from 2010 um, called Ulysses Scene. It's actually an ongoing project by a guy named Robert Berry in, um, in Philadelphia. Anybody seen this one? So Robert Berry is, in addition to being an absolutely gifted artist and illustrator, is a James Joyce scholar. And so he is adapting James Joyce's Ulysses, which is a notoriously impenetrable book, um, as a graphic novel. And he's putting in all of the references. So behind each image, you can go in and you can find out all of, all of the scholarship to unpack all of what Joyce was trying to get at. In the, and it's a mobile app. You can download the mobile app, and they add a chapter every couple of months or something like that. Um, Eric Schadauer's uh, Age of Bronze is also on this platform, which is a historical graphic novel that's around the Trojan War. And it's based on a huge amount of history, and a lot of the background stuff is incorporated into this. So this is kind of an earlier digital experiment. So basically what you're talking about is you, you've got the original work, like James and Joyce and Ulysses. However, like you said, it's so dense and it touches on so many topics. You get the full context. Yes. You get an encyclopedia. Well, there are numerous ways to adapt it. A, a, a friend of mine, a comic artist in Seattle named David Lasky, adapted Ulysses as a 16-page mini comic. So what? <laughs> it's all it's all artistic <laughs> choices. Wow. <laughs> it's a kind of an economy of storytelling that is hard to hard to come by these days. Um, so this is so that's one example. So that's one way that you can do that. Um, this is a kind of a cool one. This came out a couple of years ago for the iPad. It's called Bottom of the Ninth by Ryan Woodward. Let's see what's going on in there. Is that comics? I mean, there's a huge number of interesting creative choices here going on there. Do you guys like this? Does this, does this look like, would you read a story in this format? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think this particular one did well, but I really haven't seen very many other things. Some of the stuff that Mayfire does has this same approach, but not in the panel grid like that. It's more, it's more panel panel. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, one, well, one thing I'd, I would address here is that um, I mean, in our sense, we look at um, solving those problems about JK and, and the technological implications, <coughs> excuse me, the technology implications of time and age. So we're sort of doing the back end work to solve that for publishers and creators and individuals and studios. Um, for this, like, we see this as being very difficult and hard to make. And so we are a very, from our foundation, it's a platform of scale. So like, how do we take you know, past books that have been done, we're trying to really future-proof content. And to make something like that is, is beautiful. The story's actually really good. I, really, I, yeah. I had this with, uh, a year ago. Um, beautiful stuff. Um, I used to play baseball, and so I'm a big fan. Um, but this, yeah, this probably took a long time to make. Uh, a lot of love went into the animation, you can tell. Yeah, and you can, I mean, the way that they, especially the way that the top three panels on this particular page 
Strange sure. is, is a really interesting fusion of animation and sequential panel storytelling. So I mean, I would call this kind of thing a hybrid form. I don't, yeah. I don't know if we have a name for it yet. It's comics and animation together. Because this tells a actually pretty robust story. And there's yeah. a, it's like a few pages, but each, each panel is actually, there's time in between. So you actually, you know, you're imagining what the creator wants sort of happening in place. So again, I, I would say this is definitely comics, but just a, it's, a, it, it's, it's hybrid nature though makes right. the time arc aspect of it a little problematic because one of the things about static comics is the reader chooses how fast it reads over the panel or how long to linger on a panel. In this, some of the panels are static, some just have like a little wisp of smoke in panel four. So there's a, from my perspective, there's a kind of a pacing problem that, that is inherent in, in this kind of hybrid style. Well, they're not all going at once as pointed out, like this is the, this is kind of a demo thing that I've put up, put in this presentation, but actually you activate the animation in each panel. Oh, and I see. Go okay. through that's true, that's true. Right. So as creators, would this appeal to you as a, as a way to tell a story, if, if, assuming the technology was... Well, I always stayed away from animation because for me it was frustrating how many hours you put in for the time arc of it. Yeah. So, I mean, I already have that first, my static comic book panels because I love to obsess on backgrounds and stuff like that, and then I'll see somebody reading one of my comics and I'll flip, flip, and whoa, 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 I spent a you know, day on that. Yeah. <laughs> just just give it one more second, please. Yeah, I mean, it appeals to me conceptually. I think it's, a, I think it's, a, it's a really interesting you know, uh, step along the way of the fusion of different, different art forms. Um, but to actually do a comic like this, as, as these guys said, like, oh my god, how much work is that? And we do insane amounts of work on the illustrated books that we do. And I mean, probably most people know comic books don't pay a lot. It's kind of it's very low on the pay scale as far as uh, uh, art videos go or popular arts goes. Um, so I'd have to get a good. I have to have. I would have to have a good book deal or be in a really good economic situation to be able to put that much extra effort into it. Yeah, there was another one like this a few years ago called Operation Ajax that was extremely ambitious and it was done with by a whole studio actually. Yeah, it was about. Um, it was about the American interference in the in the um, Iran Revolution in the 1950s, and it went to all of these historical records. So it was a combination of the preceding one, the Ulysses book, because it had all of this background documentation, right. but it also had huge amount of production value and animation and stuff like that. And that studio went out of business. <laughs> oh. it, it, yeah, it was not it was not a success. And the guy actually has a the creator of that has a really interesting TED talk on. Um, on why that failed and what he learned from it. This is another cool one of mine. Uh, has anybody here seen Dim Sum Warriors? <laughs> so Dim Sum Warriors is awesome. It's so cool. It's so, so it's by this couple, uh, Yin Yin Wu, who's an educator, and her husband Colin Go, who's a cartoonist. They're originally from Singapore, and they're now they now live in Queens, and they created this to teach Mandarin to English speakers and English to Chinese speakers in Chinese-speaking countries. So every page of this, I don't have a full demo of it, but it's really cool. It's like, so each panel you pull up, you can swipe the dialogue, and it'll go from English to, to Mandarin, and then you can hear it read back to you in the native language. And because there's a huge amount of educational theory that goes into this, because if you're actually seeing characters talking to each other, you understand the context, and you know this is a younger person talking to an older person, so we're using the respectful tone, we're using a formal tone, it's younger people talking to each other, it's less formal, you know, that sort of thing. And it, it's incredibly effective. There's a video that, that Yen Yen has of her two-year-old daughter reading these pages and learning both English and Chinese, two years old, going through this and, and interacting with this on the iPad. Um, this has not only been a successful visual project, they now publish it as a, as a regular manga book, it has been adapted as a musical stage performance, and now they're in negotiation for film rights in, in China. Um, it's a really interesting thing. And again, going to the accessibility point, um, this is a self-published project. They hired, they did all the artwork, they can, came up with this thing, they hired a programmer in Singapore or somewhere to wire it all together, and they put it out there, and it's self-sustaining, it's successful. Yeah. So you're saying it's not actually a musical? They, they, the, the comic book is not musical, but it was okay. adapted as a, as a musical stage play. Yeah, yeah I was going to say, if you're going to do it in two languages as a musical, that might be a problem.
problematic. It's like a Chinese opera, but it's okay. like a, but they do it as a, like a Broadway play version of it. It's hilarious. It's apparently really cool. Rob, I want to ask your opinion about something, because you mentioned economy of storytelling when you referenced David Lasky's mini-comic <laughs> adaptation of, uh, of Ulysses, and actually something that you just said about the um, the other the other comic that has animation in it, that the, the very complicated one that was about uh, the, right, yeah, yeah. that was about the our overthrow of the Iranian government. Um, I wonder, do you think it is that this all these different forms of added content this, particularly the motion makes it more difficult to achieve the economy of storytelling that a very skilled artist can achieve with static panels. And I'm thinking in comparison to the complicated motion comic or whatever it was that you described, uh, Persepolis has beautiful, yeah. very economically told, very evocative sequences yeah. that describe basically the entire history of Iran up to the 70s where the story, where her story actually starts. Yeah, and it's done in this very simple style. And again, this is where this drama element comes into it. And you know, like the, you know, I mean, the cloud has a whole, you know, chapter and verse on on the differences between like detailed artwork and and like um, neuroscience is now telling us that there's like a, a cognitive load to looking at certain kinds of images versus others. And certain like cartoonists who are really good at this stuff, like somebody like Harvey Kurtzman, knew intuitively that how that image was going to work and like he's capable of drawing extremely detailed, complex scenes, but he chooses to strip it down to a storytelling style that's like really super efficient. And manga in, in Japan is like this too. It's meant to be read, like US comics are meant to be read like one page every 90 seconds or something like that. With, uh, yeah, with, with manga, you're supposed to read about um, four or five pages a minute. So it's, we're scanning very quickly on a, on a subway. So the, the, the storytelling art style is supposed to go with that. So do you think that when, when people are at, you know, if we're talking about comics that have motion elements or uh, immersive, really visual immersive elements, do you think that that, uh, that that makes it harder to achieve that that type of economic storytelling? What do you think? I'll, I'll, I'll I'm not saying it's better or worse, but I think it's pretty different. So in what we're seeing in, for example, a, a good example that, that, that was shown here with the, the, the page of the baseball comic is that you can go overboard once you decide that you, as a storyteller uh, and as an illustrator, <coughs> that you're going to add motion to your story, you are walking a very fine line between a cartoon and animation in a comic book. Uh, the more you add, the more expensive it gets, and the closer to a cartoon you, you know, you're, you're getting to. Uh, I personally think that if you keep it simple, that if all you're doing are basic transitions rotations, you know, changing the alpha of the picture, not only is cheaper to produce, because you're adding very basic animation, but it's also a lot closer to what a comic is, right? It's, it's a self-pacing experience. You as the reader, you know, are consuming the story at your own pace. And when you start adding animation, you know, you it's it's expensive and you know maybe it turns out to be a completely different you know medium than, than, than a comic answer. Now, now here's one that actually addresses a couple of these different points at once. Uh, this is one of my favorites. This is by the genius Randall Monroe from XKCD. So as you know, this is a talk about simple style, right? This guy does stick figures and he tells great stories with these stick figures. This particular one, however, was kind of interesting. So that last panel, it, this is, a, this is a, a strip called click and drag. And what you do is in that last panel, if you click in there, this is a webcomic, and you start dragging around, it reveals this whole landscape of stuff. And there's actually whole like wikis devoted to all of the stuff that's in this scene. They blew this up and they estimated that at 300 DPI, this would be a, a shot that is something like 60 feet wide and 29 feet tall. Holy cow. Like, so it's this gigantic mural, and as you go around it, there's all of these like little story things that are revealed in it. So it's like fully interactive. You have to, you actually have to go to the effort to get all of the story out of that frame. And it's enabled only by technology, because there's no way you could possibly do this with a, with, in a printed page. No, it, it would actually, to me, 
size of a wall. It would be the size of a wall, and also you wouldn't have the experience of looking at it through that window. Mm. It's like you're having a window into this world, and it's only possible given digital technology. Is it comics? I would, I would say no. Well, I mean, you, you like you said, it's a fully interactive experience. Um, from how I would see that is that the creator is really just giving a bound of rules and regulations that the user would follow, and so you're um, not necessarily seeing the interpreted vision of the creator, or maybe this is their vision, but from my end, I, I would see comics as a uh, linear to me, this is more pure comics than the animated one that we were just looking at, um, because because it's still it's still essentially a static image, and it requires reader reader interactivity um, the same in a, a different way than turning a page does. Um, and I think it's a fascinating idea to have a bigger world, but that but that's still flat essentially. It's still two dimensional, yeah. but you can move around in that panel. It's almost like the spotlight sort of thing. You've got this ornate big stage, but your spotlight can only illuminate a certain area of that stage. So you go to different areas that you find interesting and see yeah. what, what's there. I also you love the, with that one I also love the um, the sacks of exploration and discovery that like you're, like you, like, you know, I can imagine reading that and going like, oh my god, it does something, oh, what's that, what's that? And then I want to go into and explore in that panel. Well, it could be argued that the way that he set it up is that every time you drag, you create a new panel. So it's like, mm -hmm. because you're not looking at the whole image at once, uh -huh. you have the, you are making the, the decisions that the artist yeah. would ordinarily make about how to compose that panel. It's, again, the, I don't use the term genius lightly, right? This was a really step forward. I want to quickly go through this so I can let these guys uh, show their show their fun stuff here. So this is this big thing called Wormwood Saga, which I'll get back to. I don't know if any of you have seen this. It's um, it's a basically vertically scrolling. So when you start at the top, and as you go down the page almost infinitely, the story unfolds as it goes <coughs> scrolls. And it's uh, it's in a comic style. Again, let me let me get back to that um, because the the really interesting you know the step forward that Maypire has made is to take some of this stuff beyond uh, you know the panel and the page and create actually an immersive experience around it. So why don't I, why don't I hand over the... Um, there's a there's a web comic called uh, Sandra and Wu have you seen that I have not seen that okay uh, basically this is about a um, I would say about a junior high school girl and her raccoon that can talk <laughs> in English and in German okay. so they actually have two versions of the same comic one is in, in English the other one is in German so if you want to Then you actually have the same sort of comic. The only thing that's different would be the language right. there. But more than that, what is that? Uh, that the creator and the illustrators have been very generous in that times where they're like at a convention, <laughs> and this is a daily co a daily comic Monday through Friday, and they would have guest illustrators, guest drawers come in and do their version of Sandra and Wolf. And, and they would... Th so it's like collaborative as well as... You know. Well, yeah. They, the, there would be the normal, in which case they generally have long story arcs. Like there was a whole thing where where uh, one of Sandra's friends is in a uh, deal with Satan to save Sandra from, a, from a, a horrible fate. But at the same time, if, that, if the illustrator is at a convention or otherwise unavailable to do it, They've been very generous in letting other people come in and show their versions of Sandra and Wu, so they get not only a different illustrator, a different sense of style, but also a different point of view from the people creating. And I find that very refreshing. Yeah, very, very cool. Well, let's let's take a look at the let's take a look at what these guys have got on the on the immersive and motion book front, also. Yeah, so I'm just going to give a quick some full context of wh who we are, where we started. Uh, so we're Mayfire, we, uh, we're a technology company, but we're founded by creators. 
um, Lynn Sharp, Ben Walsenholm, guys that are publishers of amazing stories, great storytellers, uh, and then we have a tech co-founder as well. So we try to find ourselves really at the, at the crux of creativity and technology. Uh, so we have our uh, form, basically our form factor called Motion Books, which you can see this is a book mono by Ben. There's some sound effects, but there's no voiceover. So we're reading here. We're, we're very much a reading platform. And as the user in, intends to initiate through the sequence or the panel, each motion was going to... What's that? Oh, stand up. Yeah, right. There you go. So, uh, so essentially, you can see the sound is really building up that tension. It allows for the creator to have access to time as an element to the storytelling sequences themselves. So you can have reveals and really have suspense without leaving up to the reader to hold their eye uh, up at the top left without looking down. You know what I'm saying? So you're taking yeah. somebody step by step through the sequential story. And so with digital, we have some really cool things where, uh, from our end, it's with the motion and sort of the step sequences. It's about uh, really taking that reader through uh, and then paying tribute to it and making it feel natural for digital devices. So we were, this isn't a piece of paper, so we don't try to treat it like one. And when you, when you don't really use this to its full potential, it can feel really dry and just not very fulfilling. So we're trying to add that value to digital. So, uh, just one, okay. So, uh, well, so we have cool things like 360 pano illustration pages that we can integrate into the experience. Wow. And so this, so VR kind of comes into this later, but it's essentially layered art, layered uh, words and pictures, and as far as the creator, he sets the time through, and we move through the story as the reader's pace. So it's still a book, we're using the same book assets that we would print, um, and that's a motion book. And we can, we have tools to make these on the web for free, like you were saying, with DeviantArt. Uh, we have a cloud storage system, uh, asset-based, up to like 8K in the assets. So we're very much high resolution focused for the future, and when we do publish these books here, you know, we have iOS, Android, Windows 10, uh, Android TV, Apple TV, we have VR, we have Xbox coming out shortly, so we're trying to bring reading up to where like watching and playing happens. And with VR, it's really an extension of that, so we're like, we have a, the tools in the back end that are making optimized versions for each platform that it's going to. Right. So, so, it, go so in that, in the idea of actually producing art, is also how you deal with the technology. And so when you ever have a new new aspect of technology actually coming up in your company, you're able to do it with it in-house to maximize the potential. Right, yeah, we're, okay. we see ourselves as like really solving a lot of things for publishers and keeping the art of comics and reading and books like in, bringing it into the future. And we do that through, through basically layered art assets, which, which adds a sense of depth and immersion and then um, with VR and how that comes into play is we kind of re-engineer the creation uh, tools and we add that depth to those layers of the art. So then you, know, you can look around the art and so we're essentially building books, but they're just being read on whatever platform. So we're trying to see if there's like a cross-platform solution. So how does this, you said you did this, it uh, had an aspect Paul's concern about like, how do you enjoy that artwork? Oh yeah, yeah, so VR, I mean, one of the best things about this is like you can make something that's this big on a piece of paper the size of a billboard. And then like, there's no better way to pay tribute to a piece of art than like getting it and seeing it so big. It's just something about being close to something that really makes you feel it, that thing. It so. really is uh, all about, you know, both honoring the medium and the technology that you're using to display it. Uh, the very beginning we talked about paper and the texture and the smell and, and, and the quality of the ink. Uh, with these devices, you know, at the very beginning during the night we were treating them like comic books. We were just dis displaying static pictures. But these devices are capable of so much more. So as a creator, you have to honor your canvas. If, if the technology allows you to do more, go for it. Uh, with virtual reality, we're seeing a lot of what happened in the 90s uh, in respect to comic books and movies. Uh, it is a very new medium. People are still treating it like it's uh, uh, just a, a, a way to project movies, you know, on a large format while having, you know, a small form factor. 
but creators are, are learning and are adapting really quickly. So, uh, yeah. Well, we see, like the game publishers, uh, we see just huge traction from them because they're doing a whole lot of complicated storytelling and what appeals to them is a comic or a very core, uh, minimum viable product of a story that they can get out and release. And the best thing about comics and the um, illustration and two-dimensional aspect of it is that it's very easy to make and cheap and frequent. And so the way that that helps them is that they can build habits and actually add context to different things that are going on in the game. Also, when all of this stuff is digital, the boundaries between these media can go away. And you can actually have a comic, and if, let's say you're reading the Assassin's Creed comic, and then you get to a scene where you have to play through the scene to get to the next page of the comic, or something like that. So you can actually integrate some of these things into it. Um, so that would be some interesting ways to go. The, the, the issue with the game side is the cost, because the development costs for high production value games are really are really high, but comics are cheap to create. Um, and so it's you know there's a you know if you have a rich story world, the, it seems to me it would make sense to do like yeah, that, story. that that uh, thing that you displayed earlier, the Wormwood thing. When you first cleared up, that looked to me like it was a, a gaming uh, introductory yep. page where you can choose your characters and stuff like that. And and uh, certainly you can bring the comic towards what some of the advantages are in in uh, role playing games where you where you have that um, sort of um, what is it a, a tree branch where you have a start start with your story goes off in different directions but eventually comes back to two or three different endings. Mm. And you can you, you so you can take those gaming principles and design things and apply them to to, to web comics. So like choose your own adventure. Yeah, yeah. I think I'm really interested to see where all this is, you know, going over the next yeah. decades. But uh, I feel like right now there's a really high barrier to entry for individual creators who are doing creator-owned work um, for to this type of media because the 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 resources required, the technol the technological knowledge, yeah. the amount of time you're putting into it. Like the only way in tech that uh, that we could do something like this is if like we just you know, got in with you guys or some other company that was doing it. Um, I can see. Th I mean, like, I can see what you're talking about, like people from the gaming industry being really excited about it. And I'm very interested in what you guys are doing. But it's hard for me to see how uh, how individual creators working on their own passion projects will be able to use this in the near future on a you know on a wide on a more widespread level. Sure. Uh, but the thing is, if you go, if you if, if you're an independent creator going through the traditional channels, it's even more difficult. Right, because you have to approach the publishers, and the publishers, in a sense, are yeah, exactly that. You have to go to the editor, and, and it's a much more unapproachable uh, uh, way of you as being a single creator. While the technology, you know, there's always a technological barrier, but once you get past that, you're able to reach you know millions of you know people that are there. To but you can pretty easily put your work online and and. Oh, yeah, that's, that's what I'm talking about. Before yeah, yeah. you go to a publisher, and that's what a lot of that's what a lot of in small, more small scale creators do now when they're pushing, working on their own passion projects. You know? So uh, we have just addressed some of those concerns, which are great. Um, it's we love to tr understand you know the pains of of the, of the creators. I, mean, <laughs> I, I am a motion book series myself. I'm I'm a, a, a creator as well as Diego here. But we uh, we have a, a partnership with DeviantArt, and we. From the web tool that you can get on, it's free to sign up. Uh, basically, you're just dragging and dropping your assets, and then you're doing basically it's like a, a, a PowerPoint uh, sequence as far as moving things in and out. Yeah, there's a little bit of a learning curve to, to make it really polished, but um, if there's a desire to actually just get a static PDF, you can essentially do that in a matter of minutes in the tool online. You can publish right to your account on DeviantArt, and you can begin to get comments and feedback, and actually have a presence online through a community of you know, some fifty million people or something like that. Um, but we have a motion books category with DeviantArt, and this is a partnership we've had for a long time. Uh, but yeah, I'm trying to address that. Like, how do you build an audience? Like, you can do put it online, but man, the web's a big place. So we're uh, we understand that, and we're trying to address that. We're trying to make 
these very easy to make for a creator, somebody who doesn't need to learn code. Um, but that takes a lot of time and money from our end because technology is expensive. And yeah, this is it's it's like a, a personal example. Um, starting a uh, historical epic that's going to have extensive endnotes, and it's going to be a bilingual. It's going to be English and Spanish. Now, in the traditional printed thing, you'd be either reading an English copy or you'd be reading a Spanish copy, and then the endnotes would be printed back. They wouldn't. Uh, so, so you'd have to sort of if you wanted page twenty three. What is that? And so you'd have to just kind of sure. awkward back and forth. Mm -hmm. The thing that I see uh, advantage here is is that you could have a single page, and then you could just roll over it and the balloon would turn from English to Spanish or that object in the background that I'm having to have an end note on, you roll over that and that and the end note comes up on that page. Yeah. And you could also away. create, for example, if an immersive uh, tour of the environments that your that your co artist is building uh, is doing models, training, so. right, right, right. So 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 for me it's it's um it's adding, to, it's, it's, it's making the experience more convenient for the reader mm -hmm. rather than trying to necessarily take them into another form of the medium. So, so for me, I see this as a great augmentation rather than necessarily an evolution. So. I think it's really cool that you guys have that set up with DeviantArt, by the way. So oh, you're yeah. trying to like, you know, have a, have a, a you know, a social platform for it, basically, it's and also make the tool really accessible. Yeah. Oh, but, but just, yeah. I think it's just a matter yeah. of having the time to execute yeah. it. Yeah. So in the brief time remaining, do you guys want to run your clip on the on the yeah. uh, VR thing? So yeah. this is just to give you an idea of what the virtual reality experience is like. And uh, they were demoing it downstairs. I guess you guys are done with that. But, um, yeah, we're going to record it. More lights down? Very, it's some very cool stuff, and, it, and the great thing about it, in my opinion, is that it keeps that drawn. You know, getting back to that, you, that is artwork. That's not computer-generated backgrounds, right? That's, that's actually that's, that's actually that's the drawn artwork, and you can get as close to it as you want. You can look. There's a great scene in the demo where you're like looking around this sort of furnace antique room, and all of the little details that mm -hmm. they sort of put in there, um, and it, especially if you're doing something historically oriented. And you can have all of these little things that reward that attention, or you can skip past it and get to the rest of the story, and then come back later. It's like it's a very interesting idea. Mm -hmm. right. Got a lot of I recently took my first VR tour, and it was of a Salvador Dali painting. <laughs> <laughs> it was kind of mind blowing. The only, you know, like the only unfortunate aspect of that is that they had to they had to create parts of the painting that Dali never actually painted because you're going around in, inside things that aren't actually in the painting. Sure. So. so um, cool. I think we're at the end of our time here. You guys got to run. Where can they find out more about Rayfire? Uh, you guys can find us online. Uh, like Josh mentioned before, we have uh, uh, we're out on Android devices and iOS devices. Pretty much anything that has a screen. Uh, and if you guys are interested on the uh, virtual reality reader, uh, we're out right now on the uh, Oculus Gear uh, Gear VR store. And. Uh, Paul and Adam, where can people find you at the rest of the convention and find your stuff? Uh, we have a table in the dealer's room, so if you want to come by and take a look at the uh, books that we already have out and talk to Paul about his, or and or talk to Paul about his Aztec series, um, you can find us online at bigredhair.com. <laughs> <laughs> and 
I'm Rob Sokolitz. I'm in the back of the, um, of the exhibit hall. I have copies of my book for sale if anybody wants those, and I will be signing those. I'll be here um, through the end of the convention tomorrow. Um, this is my last panel, but uh, thanks to you guys. Thanks to the con for having me. Um, it's been a blast. Hope you guys are all having fun. Thank you.